twice in five weeks in Sweden. Can you believe it? I don't know how that happened, but here we are. Today we delve into the gripping story of a daring daytime heist that shocked Sweden and captured international attention. In this episode, we uncover the details of a brazen robbery that took place in a historic cathedral where priceless 17th century crown jewels were stolen by two thieves who fled on bicycle and motorboat. Stay tuned to uncover the motives, the investigation, and the surprising twists that led to the arrest and confession of the 22-year-old culprit. Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, a true crime podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously and gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. Glog is a traditional Scandinavian mulled wine with origins dating back to medieval times. It's made by heating red wine with spices like cinnamon and cloves, along with sweeteners and often spirits like brandy. This warm, aromatic drink is enjoyed during Christmas and winter gatherings, and variations, including non-alcoholic versions, have become popular. Glog's rich history and festive flavors have made it a beloved holiday tradition, both in Scandinavia and beyond. And podcast listeners, another one to watch on YouTube because this one we're lighting on fire and I didn't light my kitchen on fire, but I am not saying that it wasn't close. Anyway, to make the glog, take five cups of port wine and add to a pretty big pot. Heat to simmering and then add one cup whiskey and one cup white rum. Heat that and while you're waiting, take one cinnamon stick, one orange peel and four whole cloves and tie those up in a piece of cheesecloth. Once the glog mix is steaming but not yet boiling, light the top of it on fire. Yeah. Be careful. Uh, Pour in one eighth of a cup of white sugar into the flames and let it burn for a minute or less. Um, Put the lid on the pot to stop the fire and turn off the stove. Let the glog cool for about 10 minutes. Then throw the spice packet you made plus a small package of dark raisins and an ounce or so of blanched slivered almonds to the pot. Then let it cool to room temperature. And when it's cool, strain the glog, but save those almonds and raisins. When you're ready to serve it, you're just going to heat it back up for five minutes and then serve in a mug with some of those raisins and almonds in it. A little treat. For the mocktail version, it's almost exactly the same, except you're going to use five cups of grape juice, one cup of non-alcoholic whiskey, and a half a cup of rum syrup. The link to the kind I use is in the description box. You will not need to light anything on fire or add any sugar, but make the same spice packet and add it and the almonds and raisins to the mix once you've heated it to simmer. Serve in the same way and enjoy. On July 31st, 2018, it was a balmy July day in Stragnas, Sweden. I mean, balmy is relative. It was in the high 70s. Scorching, however, according to Stragnas Cathedral greeter Ludwig Momquist, who thought it was so odd when a man walked into the cathedral wearing tracksuit bottoms and a hoodie with the hood covering most of his face. The Strangnas Cathedral was built in the 1260s and dedicated in 1291. It's constructed largely out of bricks and is typical of buildings in the Scandinavian brick Gothic style. Charles IX of Sweden, Stensture the Elder, Maria of Palatinate Simmern, and Gustav Otto Stenbach are all entombed in the cathedral. And about 800 years after its construction, Ludwig watched a young, warmly dressed man walk straight into the cathedral like a man on a mission. A few minutes later, the young man was walking back out again, this time with another person at his side, with a duffel bag slung over his shoulder. They were one notch below running, and as soon as they made it out the door, they started sprinting to a pair of bikes that were propped on a nearby building and pedaled off at full, well, bike speed at least. At least one of the bikes was child size with a cute little basket attached to the front. A woman standing near a stunned Ludwig said, quote, well, they might have been up to something, end quote, you think? The head of the church caretakers, Stefan Eklund, was walking to midday mass when he saw the duo sprinting toward the bikes, and he did some running himself back to the cathedral, only to see that nothing seemed amiss. Ludwig was there, greeting at the door as usual, and guests of the cathedral were milling about. But you don't get to be chief caretaker of a cathedral filled with national treasures without a well-developed sense of something's going on here. So he headed straight for the place where they kept the royal jewels because, well, he's no dummy. Meanwhile, four witnesses who were having a nice lunch on the back porch of their parents' lakeside home, a few football fields away from the cathedral, were interrupted by a bike crashing into gravel, and then another, and two men sprinting toward the lake. 
The four were then startled again when an engine roared to life and the two mysterious men flew off across the lake in a speedboat. Apparently, this doesn't happen too often in this sleepy Swedish town, and it was unusual enough that those witnesses actually called the police to report the strange scene. Back at the cathedral, Stefan had rushed to the far left of the building and down into the lower sacristy. What he should have seen was this. A large glass case with precious royal crowns, orbs, and scepters. Don't ask me why someone needs a royal orb, but there were royal orbs there. So shiny, they would hurt your eyes. But instead, what Stefan saw was this. A giant hole, probably the size of a bistro table, had been shattered in the bottom left part of the case, and the rest was still together, but spiderweb cracked all to hell. Two crowns and an orb were gone. Stefan closed the door, pulled out his phone, and called the police. By that point, the jewels and the duo were gone, last seen zooming across a 440-mile square lake, a lake that is about the same size as Lake Champlain from New York and Vermont, a lake that has hundreds of islands, seemingly made for hiding, as well as being surrounded by several large towns, including the capital of Sweden, Stockholm. The missing jewels were designed for King Charles IX of Sweden and his wife, Christina. King Charles, born October 4th, 1550, ruled from 1604 to 1611 and shaped Sweden's early modern history. Charles assumed the throne during religious and political instability. He regularly clashed with the nobles to strengthen the monarchy and cement royal power. He shaped Swedish government and territorial growth throughout a transformational period. His wife, Christina, was born in 1573. The two were married in 1592, and she became the queen consort of Sweden. The marriage had numerous offspring, including Gustavus Adolphus, who would later become one of the most renowned kings in Swedish history. Christina participated in courtly events as queen consort. Piety and charity were her hallmarks. Christina continued to influence Swedish politics under her son, Gustavus, before her own death in 1625. At this time, jewelry was expressly commissioned for deceased monarchs and was brought in the burial procession and put with the deceased. Those pieces of jewelry would have been placed inside or on top of a coffin to symbolize a deceased royal's identity and social ranking. The intricate stolen gold objects had gems, enamel, and pearls, but not diamonds because they were going to be buried. They were buried and spent over 200 years with Charles and Christina's remains before being permanently displayed in 1910. Uh, not with their bodies anyway for insurance they were valued at 65 million crowns which is 6.5 million dollars but as with all relics and art it's really priceless police spokesperson thomas agnovic told swedish media quote it's not possible to put an economic value on this it is invaluable items of national interest end quote Pretty quickly, the heist made headlines around the country and around the world. It was a made-for-Hollywood heist in broad daylight with planes, trains, and automobiles, or bikes, boats, and lakes. The jewels were added to Interpol's database of stolen art within 48 hours, and authorities were hot on a cold trail. Despite boat and helicopter searches, nothing surfaced. Get it? Surface? Anyway. As per usual, lots of folks had lots of guesses about what had happened to the crowns and orb. One Swedish criminologist postulated that the heist was well-planned and executed, pointing to the escape route over water as his main piece of evidence. Authorities started to theorize, however, that this was not exactly the crime of the century. For one, there was blood. A lot of blood. It was on the glass of the case, it was on one of the scepters that was left in the case, and it was even on one of the abandoned bikes. And whoever did this left behind some of the other jewels that were only secured in the case with a little piece of wire. Just unscrew that wire and and, and whatever. According to lead investigator Lucas Sterner, quote, it sounded like, I wouldn't say a bad Hollywood action movie, but it sounded a bit sensational. At the same time, one of the guys left clear evidence in the form of blood, so I had my doubts about how professional they really were, end quote. And apparently DNA testing in Sweden is at the speed of light, at least in comparison with the U.S., and by the next morning, the analysis on the blood had come back, and the police were banging down the door of 22-year-old Nicholas Backstrom, who was apparently no stranger to crime. Shocking. He naturally did not answer the door. Nicholas lived in Akersberga, a suburb of Stockholm. Apparently, Nicholas was a fairly innocuous and likable guy. Some described him as even shy. He had been helping his buddy build boat piers that summer. Six weeks later, Nicholas turned him in to the police station 30 minutes from his house. Despite the fact that he turned himself in, 
despite the fact that there were a horde of eyewitnesses, and despite the fact that his DNA was all over, and I do mean all over the crime scene, Nicholas said that he had nothing to do with the crime. Nicholas's trial started five months after the heist. During the trial, Nicholas testified, which I might have recommended that he not do, but then again, I don't know much or really anything about Swedish law and the Swedish justice system, but anyway, during his testimony at the courthouse in Ekelstuna, Nicholas claimed that he had just wandered into the cathedral the day of the heist and heard a loud noise, a banging sound. He saw two men walking away from the jewel room and looked in to see a shattered display case. When he saw that he could potentially get his own bag, he reached into the hole. Oh, but he cut his hand, bleeding everywhere. Ah, that's how it happened. And as for the bike and the boat, he apparently had stolen those to give to somebody else. And the motive for that, he didn't say. Oh, that's strong, reasonable doubt. Yeah, mm mm-hmm, that's my sarcastic voice. He admitted to Googling the items before the day of the crime and said there was no pre-planning, even though the bikes had been left near the cathedral several days before, and he admitted to putting a sledgehammer in a bag in a bush next to the cathedral in advance. But no, 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 definitely no planning or forethought. Just found a random hole in an already smashed display case. Sure, sure. On the last day of the trial, February 15th, 2019, the two prosecutors got a call from Lucas, that lead investigator. In the pre-dawn hours, a security guard in Akersburga spotted an upside-down trash can on the top of a blue car with the word BOMB spray-painted on its side. Investigators had been trying everything they could to find the jewels, but had been unsuccessful for those 11 weeks between the heist and this early morning, when police looked inside the trash can and didn't find a bomb, but instead found the three missing treasures. The king's crown was twisted all to heck, and a bunch of the pearls and crystals had fallen off. Some were even missing. The two halves of the orb had come apart, and it was scratched and dented. The queen's crown, luckily, was relatively unscathed. And in another speed run to process DNA, it was determined that Nicholas had indeed touched those jewels. So much for his explanation of what had happened. He actually had the jewels, so he must have done it. Jurors thought so too, and found him guilty pretty quickly after that. He was sentenced to four and a half years in prison. Nicholas refused to give up his accomplice, but it turns out they didn't need him to, because 26-year-old Martin Canermo's DNA was also found on the jewels. Martin was a carpenter, who by all accounts was a pretty nice guy. Martin had a ready excuse. Someone had given him the jewels, and he, Martin, wanted them to be found. So he, Martin, was the one who came up with the clever, oh so clever, bomb ruse. His DNA was on the objects because he wore his work gloves, and by accident he'd wiped his face with those work gloves and got it onto the orbs and stuff. He had to come up with this elaborate scheme to return the jewels because he didn't want police to suspect him stealing them. Martin himself had just been released from a three-month prison stint for stealing over $200,000 worth of internet cable. The case against Martin was a little more tricky. Eyewitnesses couldn't identify him as they hadn't gotten a clear view of his face. However, investigators found a Swish payment of around $43 with the message, thank you, on the day of the heist. Swish is the Swedish equivalent of Venmo, it seems. Who was this payment to? apparently a random guy who had helped them tow their speedboat across the lake when it broke down. He was being a good Samaritan, accidentally helping some wanted fugitives. The pair thanked him and wrote down his phone number, and the good accidental criminal was surprised to see a little payment in his Swish account. That was enough to try Martin too for the crime, and despite the fact that now convicted felon Nicholas spoke on Martin's behalf, that somehow wasn't enough, and Martin was sentenced to three years in prison in August of 2019 after losing his appeal on the trial he was found guilty in. The stolen jewels were returned to the cathedral in 2020, two years after their theft, and placed in a similar glass case. They have been completely restored to their former glory, and there is no additional security or measures to protect them. You can visit the jewels in much the same way that Martin and Nicholas did that day. I do not advise doing what they did when they visited, however. Martin has since been released from prison, and I couldn't find anything about what he was up to except for refusing interviews. Around the time of this recording, actually, is around the time that Nicholas should be released from prison, and apparently he has shown lots of remorse for his role in the heist, and he has used his time in prison to study Many who are close to the case think that this is just really a situation of two friends with a bad idea who executed that idea badly. 
Even though the case is officially closed, Lucas, the lead investigator, doesn't think that this is the whole story. He actually went up to Nicholas at the trial and asked him to get with him in 10 years after the statute of limitations on this crime will have expired. Then Lucas hopes he'll get the full story. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Thanks for hanging out with me. Please don't steal priceless jewels. It rarely, if ever, works out. And besides, you're not going to sell this stuff and get rich. You're just not. I blame a non-fully formed frontal lobe for this crime. <laughs> Two more episodes left this season. Did you know you can drink right along with me? I put the drink recipes in the description box each upload, and I also put the ingredients in there for the following week's drink so you can go shopping. Oh, and pro tip. If you aren't watching the YouTube, you may not notice that I keep several staples in my liquor cabinet. Those are the base liquors like rum and vodka. Those I purchase in bigger bottles, but for the specialty liquors and especially the liqueurs, I always buy the little bottles. I make half of that little bottle one part in my recipes, so each bottle ends up making two parts. I found a liquor store that sells those for a dollar a piece. Who needs a whole bottle of apple vodka, am I right? <laughs> Get a small one. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to stealing priceless artifacts, ruining them, and stuffing them into a trash can for no discernible reason.